Hello, everyone. Welcome to session five of LTech 676. I want to begin by saying how much I've been enjoying watching your critical reflections about various school technologies. You covered a wide range of technologies from the mighty pencil and paper to the trusty overhead projector to things like the ukulele and synthesizers. The point of that assignment, of course, was to begin to think about the values embodied in educational technologies. Now, one way values have been defined is as trans-situational goals that vary in importance and serve as guiding principles in the life of a person or a group. In fact, in 1992, Professor Shalom Schwartz from Hebrew University created the now famous theory of basic human values. According to Schwartz, his goal was to identify a comprehensive set of values that are recognized in all societies. Initially, he identified 10 individual human values, which was eventually revised and expanded up to 19 values in 2012. And you can see a list of those 19 values here on the right. One value, for example, is achievement or success according to social standards. Another value is benevolence, the caring or devotion to the welfare of in-group members. Now, obviously, every individual and or group pursues these values to varying degrees. Interestingly, Schwartz argued that having a theory of values can advance our understanding of the domain of values itself and our ability to use values to study other phenomena. Of course, that's what we're trying to do here in LTEC 676, to use values as a lens for thinking about the relationship between specific educational technologies and teaching and learning. Notably, Schwartz and colleagues argued that human values form a circular motivational continuum and, accordingly, any adjacent values such as conformity, humility, and tradition are compatible and have similar motivational meanings. On the other hand, opposite values such as humility and hedonism express conflicting motivations. In this class, we can use a theory of human values like this one or any of the many others that are out there to help us evaluate specific educational technologies such as the ones you explored in Critical Reflection 3. And just to pick two extreme examples, we could compare and contrast Jennifer's example of the pen and paper with Hannah's example of Google Drive and Docs. I think we could all agree that the values embodied by these two technologies are very different, and it is a valuable intellectual exercise to think about how they're different and why. And with that, my friends, we now round the corner into our next theme, technology and equity in schools. Now, last week, we focused in on educational technology by looking at the definition of ed tech. We also talked about how schools use technology, five areas of potential impact, as well as the various rationales for investing in educational technology. Now this week, we're going to broaden our perspective slightly to really look at the relationship between education and technology. And this will be our introduction to theme number two, technology and equity in schools. Now to begin, I want to highlight a tension that exists when it comes to the relationship between education and technology. And you can see this tension play out in the polarizing headlines about educational technology. So take a look at these headlines shown here. No more pencils, no more books, just a tablet PC. Or no child left untableted. Or meaningful integration, optimistic about iPads in schools. Those are all headlines from popular press sources. Now, let me show you some contrasting headlines here on the right. A Silicon Valley school that doesn't compute. Seeing no progress, some schools drop laptops. One-to-one -one computing has failed our expectations. 
So my question is, what's going on here? How can there be these polarizing headlines where on one end of the continuum, we have these very enthusiastic and optimistic headlines about educational technology, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, we have these very critical, somewhat negative, or at least questioning headlines about educational technology. What's going on here? How can that be? Take a look at this October 2018 story in the New York Times that had the title, The Digital Gap Between Rich and Poor Kids is Not What We Expected. Now take a look at the subtitle, America's Public Schools Are Still Promoting Devices with Screens, Even Offering Digital-Only Preschools. The rich are banning screams from class altogether. And here's a quote from that article. But now, as Silicon Valley's parents increasingly panic over the impact screens have on their children and move towards screen-free lifestyles, worries over a new digital divide are rising. It could happen that the children of poorer and middle-class parents will be raised by screens, while the children of Silicon Valley's elite will be going back to wooden toys and the luxury of human interaction. What I want to highlight about this particular quote is the words new digital divide. So let's talk about the various digital divides that exist or have existed in education. Well, the first digital divide we might think of as the traditional digital divide, which was the gap between students who had access to devices and internet connectivity at school and at home and those who did not. That's traditional digital divide. However, there's a new digital divide, and this is being called the digital use divide. And this is defined as the disparity in how students use technology. Many students use technology to create, design, build, explore, and collaborate whereas others use it to consume media passively. Now, interestingly, this divide is present in both formal and informal learning settings, as well as across high and low poverty schools and communities. And you could see over here on the right, an image of the digital use divide that was used in the 2017 National Education Technology Plan from the U.S. Department of Education. Now, I've highlighted here in these definitions the word access and use, but of course the Warshower article pointed out that if we really want a broader perspective on how to think about and analyze issues of technology and equity as it relates to education and society as a whole, we have to look at access, we have to look at use, and we have to look at outcomes. Access, use, and outcomes. Now it's time to talk about equity and equality and the idea that equity and equality are not actually equal. Now let's take a look at these two diagrams. Let's make a distinction between educational equality and educational equity. Now, equality, as shown on the left, aims to ensure that everyone gets the same things in order to enjoy full, healthy lives. Now, the example on the right, educational equity, in contrast, involves trying to understand and give people what they need to enjoy full, healthy lives. And so you can see on the left, everybody is getting the same resources. The educational resources are equal. However, on the right, the educational resources are distributed differentially based on the needs of the individuals. Now, there's a problem with the graphic on the right. Now, the problem with that graphic has to do with where the initial inequity is located. In the graphic, some people need more support to see over the fence because they are shorter. This suggests an issue inherent to the people themselves. That's fine if we're talking about height, but this is supposed to be a metaphor for other inequities. And when that happens, this becomes problematic. In the graphic, they are metaphorically shorter and need more support. But that is not why the so-called achievement gap in education exists. As many have argued, it should actually be termed the opportunity gap because the problem is not the abilities of the students, but in the disparate opportunities they are afforded. This metaphor is actually a great example of what has been called deficit thinking, an ideology that blames victims of oppression for their own situation. Here is a different set of images. They convey more or less the same information. However, notice that the people are the same size. 
This eliminates any notion of a deficit point of view. The people are equal. However, the opportunity to watch the baseball game is not equal because take a look at the ground. The ground is uneven, as is the fence. Therefore, educational equality results in a different opportunity experience than educational equity shown on the right. Now, I'm sure you've seen all kinds of these diagrams before. Here's another example. In the example on the left, we have educational equality, where we have two towns, and they get the same amount of community resources. But as you can see, one town needs resources to a greater degree than the other town. In terms of educational equity, shown in the graphic on the right, we can see that the community resources are distributed differentially based on the needs. As a result, the outcome of the two towns look more similar. Ultimately, we're going to need this semester a definition of equity. And as it turns out, equity in education has two dimensions. The first dimension is fairness. And fairness has to do with ensuring that personal and social circumstances, such as your gender, your socioeconomic status, or your ethnic origin, are not obstacles to achieving educational potential. So, in this class, I want you to be thinking about how is technology impacting the fairness dimension of equity in education? That's a big question. Let's talk about the second dimension of equity in education. The second dimension is inclusion, and this has to do with ensuring a basic minimum standard of education for all members of society. For example, everyone should be able to read, write, and do basic math. And like with the first dimension, I ask, how is technology impacting the inclusion dimension of equity in education? And of course, we can think back to those polarizing headlines. And is it possible that understanding of fairness and inclusion as they relate to education is part of the reason why we're seeing these polarizing headlines when it comes to technology and schools? Now, in closing, I want to ask you this question. Let's come back to this graphic here. And the question is, what and where is educational technology in this illustrated metaphor? Is it the ground? Is it the fence? Is it the boxes? Or is it the game that the three people are watching? What and where is educational technology in this metaphor? We'll be thinking about that question in the weeks ahead. Okay, that's all for now. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.